All right, let's look at the next example, 659. Let's copy down the parameterization that's given to us of this surface S. Given a surface S, described by position vector RVEC. It's going to be a surface, so I'll need two parameters. Default is U and V. So this is going to be a surface that sits in three space, so I'll need three component functions. And let's see. I'm going to write this down as cosine V and then sine V. Let me clean up my V there. Sine V. Just to highlight the similarity of the cil cylinder that we saw in the previous video. Now, each x and y component function is actually a product. And then we have sitting in front a u and then a u again. Let me go ahead and put a highlight like what we did before. Let's go orange for v. And then come up here and let's now look at the restriction on v. And it goes from 0 to 2 pi. And as I highlighted, this was similar, or as seen before in the cylinder, that it makes sense, hopefully, to you, that the restriction is a natural full revolution from 0 to 2 pi. And then if you recall, in polar coordinates, x equals r cosine theta, here in this example, v is acting like theta. Then once again, x equals r cosine theta. The u is acting like r, the radius. So as we've been taking the class, I've stressed strenuously, vector valued r vec and scalar valued r, it helps tremendously to be able to distinguish the two. So the comment that I just made is that u is acting like the radius r. All right, let's put a nice yellow highlight on the u quantity. And then let's go over here and note that the restriction on the u parameter is all non- what can u not be? u cannot be negative, but it can be 0. So all non-negative u's, or all non-negative values. And then let's take a look at what uh, the z-coordinate's doing, and it's just taking the radius u and then squaring it. OK, so if you pick a value for u, then you're picking a size of a circle. So think about a circle of that size. Then draw it by allowing the v to vary from 0 to 2 pi. Now you have a circle, and then you have picked a u quantity. So whatever the height is, since height only depends on u, let me bring in the nice yellow highlight here. The height, the z coordinate, only depends on u, or other, in other words, the radius. Whatever you pick for the radius, the height will be fixed. And then for the height, they're using the, the radius squared. So think of that as z equals r squared. And then if you were to draw that in the r z plane, you'd get a parabola. But now take any of these points, and that's a point for v fixed, and allow it to vary from 0 to 2 pi, and then you would produce a circle. So this is a paraboloid. paraboloid. So open up the book and take a look at the picture to verify that. All right, here's another common surface, a sphere. So let's take a look at the picture. In the picture, we can see familiar coordinates, rectangular, x, y, z. We can say spherical, rho, 
In spherical coordinates, theta appears. But theta also appears in cylindrical coordinates. Now, since we want to talk about the picture, it is a sphere. And when you read the book, it'll tell you that the radius is rho. And as you're reading through the book for that particular section, they are referring to rho not as a variable, but rho as a fixed quantity. So it's a little bit annoying the way they did that, but you need to be aware of that. And it should be obvious that once you pick your ball, your sphere, that it's going to be of some fixed radius. So in this case, rho is fixed. The reason why they use the variable rho is because everything that they say applies for any value that you pick for rho. But once you've picked a value, then rho is fixed. So rho naught would have been better notation. All right. Okay. So radius rho is a nice equation, which in spherical coordinates, that is all that you need to say in, to describe this sphere. And then you can go back and you can think of how rho squared is x squared plus y squared plus z squared. All right, let's take a look uh, at what they've done here in the book. So I've copied over the parameterization. Let's copy that parameterization here that the book gives for us. Let's go back up and look at this guy. So the sphere of a fixed radius rho is given by a position vector. It is a surface, so it needs two parameters. We're going to vary phi and theta, two parameters. Rho is fixed, so we write rho. That looks like a variable, but it's a fixed quantity. And cosine theta, sine phi. And rho sine theta, sine phi. And then rho cosine phi. Okay. All right. So now let's take a look. And let's look at the x component function and also look at the y component function. And then when we look at those guys, when we think about the a uh, radius in the plane, so let's write this out, that r squared is x squared plus y squared. So this is something that we know. In the plane, r squared is equal to x squared plus y squared, equation of a circle. Then we have our position vector for the sphere. So if we pick any point on the sphere, then that point sits in space. It has an x-coordinate. It has a y-coordinate. So plug in the x, plug in the y, and then you get this next expression. So let's take a look. Here's x, and then you quantity square x. And here's y, and you quantity square y. If we look at what they have in common, they have rho, and they have sine phi in common. So each of those quantity, each of those factors gets squared, and it's present in this sum end and this sum end, so we can factor it off. After factoring it off and distributing the power 2, we get cosine squared and sine squared. And that's cosine squared of input parameter theta, sine squared of same input parameter theta. Therefore, we can apply the Pythagorean identity. That goes to 1. And then we get this. 
And then looking at this, we can see that the radius of a circle is drawn in the, in the xy plane. If we take horizontal cuts of our sphere, that that horizontal cut is going to yield a circle, and the circle will have radius rho sine phi. And so that's all they're trying to do here. All right, nice. Okay, so we've done quite a few examples of parameterizing a surface. When we're looking at a surface, we want the surface to be nice. If you're talking about a function, you want a function to be nice. That means typically continuous. If you want it to be even nicer, then the function should be differentiable. When we're talking about curves and now talking about surfaces, the word nice is going to be smooth. That's the translation. So for a curve to be smooth, the definition was that the derivative, or velocity, is never zero. You're describing a curve, describing a curve. If you get velocity zero, then you stop. Even though the parameter t continues, 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 you stop. And the difficulty is that if that happens, then you're going to end up typically with a kink in the curve or a sharp corner. Hence, the word smooth is appropriate. So from curve to surface, the definition of smooth is similar. We don't want something to go to zero. In the case of the curve, that's the velocity. And in the case of a surface, it is this quantity. So let's write that down. So if we take a surface S and it's given by a position vector, R vec, then we can say that the surface is smooth if this position vector has a partial derivative with respect to one variable, one parameter. The position vector needs to have a partial derivative with respect to both variables, u vec and v vec. Now that each of those quantities exists, vector 1, vector 2, let's take those two vectors and let's compute their cross product. This is a vector product, so this is going to be a vector. And we don't want this to be the zero. The book is terrible. Not zero, not the zero vector is what they should say. So we don't want this to be, we can't write that, that doesn't make sense. Not the zero vector. And then that has to be true for all points uv in the parameter domain. Okay, so that's what smooth is. And then the notion is going to be the same, that this condition will yield surfaces which don't have sharp corners. Okay, so looking here at these examples of some surfaces, this guy here, a donut, more technically called a torus, is smooth. And then this pyramid is not smooth because clearly it has edges that are sharp. However, there are only finitely many sharp corners. So if you consider surfaces in between those sharp corners, you get something which is smooth. They're just planes. Hence, the pyramid is piecewise. You can break it into pieces, and each of the pieces is smooth. That's a nice notion. It's called piecewise smooth.